the speaker how will I introduce him. But he has a short answer. He said, just introduce me that I am a missionary. So he is a missionary. And he seemed to be an embodiment of mission. Uh, he is Dr. Abner Dyson. He is the, uh, one of the professors of IAS, particularly professor of missiology. He is married to Myla Dyson, who is not able to worship with us because she went to uh, Andrews to take also doctor in missiology. So we can see that um, mission is not only a part of his life, but mission is his life. And in fact, we have here in the Philippines, we call it PFM, Philippine Frontier Mission. This uh, institution established many congregations already in the Philippines. Please help me welcome Dr. Abner P. Dyson, who will be presenting to us from broken to fruitful, making discipleship work in Asia. Good morning, everyone. When I told him, make it short, sometimes it doesn't work. So maybe next time I'll say, make it very long. And then maybe it'll be his short it. Uh, yes, I can use that. Last night when I attended uh, the session, the special Vesper, I saw that there were uh, a bit fewer people here. And I was torn uh, between wanting to have more people today and wanting to keep it as small as last night. Uh, simply because even in the past 21 years of ministry, I have never been used to preaching to a large crowd. Uh, when I was a missionary, we only had four converts. And so we had a very, very small church. Uh, during uh, Sabbath school, when I would, uh, I would be giving this, the mission spotlight, and my partner, the other missionary, would give the special number, and there are four people uh, listening to us. During the divine worship, I would, uh, my, my partner would preside, I would be the preacher, and the special number are the four people. So you can imagine at one time, everybody's in the pulpit. Well, one, one thing I like about academic exercise um, is, well, there are two things about academic exercises like this, the forum. One is, you're not allowed to go beyond 30 minutes. That's a bad thing. But the good thing is, in academic uh, forums like this, you're allowed to be boring. <laughs> well, you see, it's like this. They said the higher you go, um, the, more, the less emotion you need to put in your writing, right? It has to be objective. And so when I preach today, it's not about how I preach, but what I preach, okay? So you can just, some of you can just download the PowerPoint. And the important thing is the content, not the way we preach. Amen? <laughs> well, some of you don't, don't want that. But anyway, I have my dear professor here that taught me some of the uh, creative teaching method, and I'm going to use it uh, today. It's not as good as when she taught it, uh, Dr. Gaikwad, um, Prema. I'm thinking of a word. Now, there are two news items that I'm going to show you and try to see if you can guess the word that I'm trying to think of. First one is this. 30-year-old baby wears diapers and sleeps in a crib. The second news item some of you are familiar with the church turned into temple after 72 Valmikis reconvert to Hinduism. The Adventist church overnight turned into a temple adorned with portrait of Shiva after the successful reconversion of 72 Valmikis had become SDA Christians in 1995. 
Okay. Now let's see if you can guess. One word to describe these two news items. The first one is the 30-year-old baby. And the second one is the SD church turned into a Hindu temple. One is about child rearing. The other one is about discipleship. What is the word? There's no right, right and wrong, but there's right because I, I'm thinking of that word. The word is broken. It's a broken child rearing and a broken discipleship. Nowadays, there's a lot of talk about discipleship. In fact, I googled up, well, actually, I went to Amazon.com and looked for books that has discipleship as a title. And there were 100 pages, and each of the pages is about 12 books. So can you imagine, now, I did not look through all of it. Maybe some of them are just novels. Uh, but 100 pages times 12, so many books on discipleship, right? So we don't really need to talk about discipleship. Just go and buy and read and you should be very good in discipleship already. Well, this forum is all about discipleship. And uh, we'll talk about some of the issues. Now, I read an article that says, There is a deficit in many of the churches today. Many churches are suffering from a deficit. Not a deficit of money although many churches have that, not economic deficit, but what they call discipleship deficit. Now, when I say deficit, we're talking about shortage, deficiency, or simply the amount is too small. So we'll, we'll talk about that, and, and the title of my sermon, I revised it a little bit, is From Broken to Bearing Fruit, Making Discipleship Work. But before we move on, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite your presence to be with us. We ask you to speak to us. May the things that we will consider today be things that will feed our souls and things that will help us in our discipleship walk and in the ministry that you have given each and every one of us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What is discipleship? Okay, what is Christian discipleship? I, I like this uh, definition. It says here, Christian discipleship is the process by which disciples grow in Jesus. It is also the process in which people are equipped by the Holy Spirit to overcome and to become more and more Christ-like. I like that definition, but I like this one better. It's shorter. It says here, Christian de discipleship is, is a noun that simply means to turn all people into fully devoted, mature followers of Christ. The key words here is fully. Now, when we say fully, how, 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 ma how, ma how many percent is that? 100%. Fully devoted and then mature followers of Christ. Now, one of my, in some of my troubles, one of my problems is buying some things, okay? Uh, when we go to a place, we always calculate, we convert the money. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, they say it's not good. When you go to the States and you keep on counting, oh, it's only one dollar, and then you translate it in, in peso, and then you don't want to buy it anymore. Uh, but they say in Korea, uh, there's this, uh, money. 50,000 won, right? 50,000 won, Korean won. And uh, when you have that, you feel very, very uh, rich. Because here in the Philippines, we have, when you have 50,000 pesos, wow, that's, uh, that's a lot of money. But 50,000 won is only 2,034 pesos. Okay? Now, I like this experience that I had when I was in Indonesia. Okay, I don't want to embarrass anyone, okay? It's just that the first time I went to Indonesia, I felt so rich. I exchanged $100 and I got 1 million rupiah. And one of my friends says, they took a picture of it and sent it back home. They said, I'm a millionaire in Indonesia. 
So whenever I have 100,000 rupiah in my pocket, I, I, I'm very happy. But you know how much it is? For those of you who don't know, uh, it's only 340 pesos. Um, I don't know why. Maybe there's a lot of uh, paper in Indonesia. That's why I did that. Anyway, let me ask you a question. Are there many SDAs in your country or district? Yes or no? Well, some, some countries here, you would probably say no. Some countries here, like Philippines, uh, Korea, um, some, somewhere in uh, maybe Peru, uh, you have so many Adventists in your country. The ratio is very, very good. Next question. Do you notice that they are not as zealous and committed as other SDAs in other parts of the world? Now, if your answer here is yes for both, then you have a membership inflation and a discipleship deficit. You know what I'm saying? Your money is so much and it means very little. Friends, we want to see disciples who are really making a difference. Amen? We don't want to just have numbers. It's not how many people there are in the church. It's how, it's how many of them have a vibrant walk with Jesus. Now, many of the problems that we have, why we have the discipleship deficit, one of the authors, uh, uh, his name is Ed Stetzer, said, it comes from the fact that we are following broken discipleship models. Let me briefly share with you four things, and I, I, would, like to, I would like to call it models, because many times we follow it, uh, whether we know it or not, and these are not going to help us develop good disciples. Number one is the quote-unquote academic discipleship. Now, when I say academic discipleship, this is equating religious knowledge with discipleship. We think, we, we just say, read this, study this, memorize this, and good to go. Uh, we think all they need is knowledge. If that's all they need, just give them the Bible and no, no more uh, worship and, and, and so on and so forth. The point is not information. The point is transformation. Many of us like information. I like information. But there is what they call paralysis of analysis. You have, you, you've studied it so much and yet you don't know how to apply and discipleship many times can be like that. Um, but God wants us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, knowledge is important, but we need to realize it's not the cognitive knowledge that changes people. It's the relational knowledge. Some of you are very good in biblical studies, and you talk about when Adam knew Eve. There is that concept, and when you say you knew someone, it's not, it's not just intellectual knowledge. There's a fruit that comes out of it. It's a relationship. The second problem, uh, discipleship model that is broken, is the program discipleship. Now, discipleship is not a six-week program. It's not a curriculum. It's not a, uh, uh, some of us offer a book or a class when what is needed is a life. Now, many of us will ask, how do we do this? It's so easy to just have a, a list of uh, lessons to give. That's more sustainable. But making disciples is a subjective thing. In fact, somebody said, God deals with each and every person differently. Yes, there are some common denominators, and I'll be sharing that in the, this afternoon. But God deals with everyone differently. Therefore, there is really so many kinds of discipleship. But it's not a program. It's not, it's not about religious program. It is about relationship. Not just a relationship with each other, but a relationship with Jesus. It is a lifelong involvement in the life of Christ through the Holy Spirit and in the life of the church, which is the body of Christ. Number three problem is what they call the Lazy John discipleship. In the Philippines, we have this one, Juan Tamad. Uh, Lazy John. Can you see what he's doing? There is a fruit that is ripe already, but he's so lazy, he's just waiting for it to drop. 
Now, there is this model of discipleship where we think that we can grow without any effort at all. If you, if you, if, if you advertise and say, this is a very good discipleship church, you only spend 15 minutes in the church, and then you don't have to read anything, you don't have to do anything, and then you don't have to give your tithes and offering, so on and so forth, there will be a lot of people going to that church. Because we think we can grow without any effort. They only want to go to church and stay away from the really big sins. But there's, there needs to be an, an, uh, an you have to have intentional uh, effort to grow. Discipleship takes every believer's intentional effort. Exercise is needed. Believers must take steps to grow. Now later on, we'll talk about it, that it, you're not the one growing yourself. But then you have to have cooperation. You have to have involvement. There is no passive spectator as far as discipleship is concerned. In fact, Philippians 2.12 says, work out your own salvation. Now this can be a, um, um, what, what do you call it? There, there can be some debate over this. And, but it's not about righteousness by works. It's about spiritual survival. Spiritual discipline is not about being holier than thou. Spiritual discipline is about surviving spiritually. Just like eating is not, uh, it's not about so that you can be called a man. Eating is because you're a man or a woman. You need it to survive. And then finally, the fourth model that is broken is what I would call homiletics discipleship. Now, pardon me for the words. It, it might be linked to some of your discipline. It's, I'm, I'm not referring to your discipline. I just, for want of the word, I, I use this word. This is the belief that if people just listen to my sermons, they will grow spiritually. Now, pastors, and I'm included in that, have this bloated idea that we are the only person needed by the church to grow the church. And there is this arrogance that all the church needs for its discipleship program is for me to preach every Sabbath and Wednesday night and, and Friday night and to give some uh, lectures. And so it revolves around us. In the U.S., they had a research, and they said that 56% of pastors there believe that their weekly sermon or teaching times most are, is the most important discipling ministry in church. I don't think that's, true. That's, that's, that's correct. Let's not think our sermons determine the growth of the church members. Stop thinking that our preaching is enough to be the church discipleship strategy. Discipleship is not a Sabbath midweek or vespers event, it is a daily process. It is commitment. It's being 100% involved in the life of Christ. Now, talk about commitment. When we talk about commitment, in the church, we, want, we, we like to have donations. When we give the tithe, we say we have a percent. But the offering, it's up to you. Okay? Many times, discipleship is, is a donation that we're giving to God. Instead of a commitment, we are just donating part of ourselves, part of our time, part of our money, part of our outreach, part. That's not true discipleship. Discipleship does not ask for your wallet. Discipleship asks for your heart. When you give the heart, everything follows. Well, what are some of the principles that I found? There are so many principles in the Bible that, that, that relates to discipleship. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't listen to some of the, the presentations. I'm sure many of this had come up already. Uh, last night I heard um, the, the sermon and some of the things. I said, oh good, that he emphasized some of those things. Now, I, I have listed five things, that, five principles that would help into making us instead of broken disciples, into fruit-bearing disciples. Number one principle is that the focus of discipleship. Now, discipleship is all about following Jesus. The focus is Jesus. In, in, uh, in Matthew 4, 19 to 20, he says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, it seems so simple 
and yet so complicated. A small child can easily obey, and yet a, a university professor can find it very difficult to understand exactly how to do it. Now, come near behind me. The original word used was diute, which means come near, and then opiso, which means behind. So actually, he's not, he was not saying follow me. He's saying come near behind. Now, another translation would be come near behind Jesus. Follow his steps. You cannot be a disciple unless you first come near Jesus. There's no such thing as discipleship that is long distance. There's no such thing as discipleship that does not want to be very personal. Many times in church, we don't want to have small groups because it makes it so personal. They want to ask why I was not in church last Wednesday. They want to ask, what is my problem? And so when, I, when people ask me, how are you? And they say, I'm good. Even though you have a thousand of worries, so many problems, you say, I'm okay. So when you say, happy Sabbath, you say, happy Sabbath. We're not being personal. Now, with Jesus, you can't be like that. You have to come near to him. And then you have to be behind him. In, in 1 John 1, 6 and 7, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, it's about walking. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk the way Jesus walked, then our discipleship makes sense. And in fact, in 1 John 2, uh, 6, it says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Okay, implications. If we want to grow into mature, responsible disciples, we must draw near to Jesus. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to draw near to Jesus. I'm just saying, draw near to Jesus. Whatever is the way to go, come near him, if, if by listening to uh, religious music, you feel closer to him, do it. If going to nature and reading the Bible there in, alone it makes you feel closer to Jesus, do it. If, if uh, being with people and praying with each other and talking with each other about Jesus makes you feel closer to Jesus, do it. Whatever it takes, do whatever it takes to draw near Jesus. Now, when we do evangelism, it's about helping others to become disciples. The goal should be heart conversion, not just intellectual conviction. Again, many times the problem with disciples, discipleship, is they started wrong. And therefore, when they start wrong, it's so difficult to put them in the right place. When we get people to come and they, and, and they came because they were looking for a sack of rice, and then you expect them to come to church when you're not giving anything, you, you, won't, you won't see them coming to church. So we, they need to fall in love with Jesus. And not, we always talk about the truth, the present truth. It should not be an abstract. The truth is Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says we need to keep in step with the Spirit. A true disciple walks with Jesus. Now, disciples must follow Jesus. I like the comment of Dr. Song. Uh, I heard him saying, whose disciple are you? Uh, are you the, disip the discipler? Are you the disciple? Okay. Uh, there's this one man, well-known in the 19th century, Spurgeon. How many of you have heard of Spurgeon? Okay. And uh, the story goes that he, the great pastor in 19th century London, was walking down the street one day. And a man who was drunk and leaning on the lamppost yelled out to him. He said, Mr. Spurgeon, do you remember me? He was drunk. And he said, do you remember me? Well, Spurgeon said, no, should I? And uh, why, why should I? And he said, because I'm one of your converts. And you know what was the answer? He said, well, you must be my, my uh, convert because you're certainly not the convert of Jesus. Friends, how many converts have you made? How many disciples have you made? Throw away the number. The question should be, how many of Christ's disciples have you enlisted? Jesus says, make them my disciples. He didn't say, go and make your own disciples. Now, 
Principle number two is this. The cost of discipleship is sacrifices and hardship. Do you believe that? Well, many times, many times we think, we, let's make the gospel easier. My father used to be a, a district pastor, and when the, when the pastor, the president, would look for baptism, and he would have very few baptism, he would be scolded publicly in the meeting. And then my father told the president, well, if you want many converts, let's open the gates wider. You know what I'm saying? Jesus says, narrow is the gate. But wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Now, when you see thousands and thousands and thousands of people converting, either that's Pentecost or you have opened wide the gate. And many times, as pastors, we, we come in contact with, with, with those who say, okay, let's just, let's just fill up the questionnaire, the baptismal questionnaire. And then they say, okay, let's go through the questionnaire. Okay, uh, who is Ellen White? Oh, no, you don't need to just check it. Okay, uh, like this, do you uh, smoke or whatever? Oh, okay, no, never mind, we'll check it. Anyway, God will change you later on after baptism. That's not biblical discipleship. True discipleship always involves sacrifices and hardships on the part of the disciples. In Luke 14, 26-27, we, we are told, if anyone comes to Jesus, remember the same word, come. If anyone wants to draw near to Jesus, and he does not hate his own family. Now, that's, that's against the, the family ministries. Okay? <laughs> but, but of course, you have to study uh, the context. But the point here is that even... Even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross, whatever that cross may be, the sacrifices that you need to do, there will always be sacrifices. In Romans 12, 1, it says, there is this mold of the world. Don't let the world force you into this mold. There will always be a countercultural influence if you are truly a disciple of Christ. There is contextualization, yes, we'll talk about that. But there will always be counter to the prevailing values of the world, and that becomes a cross. You will be ostracized. People will say, you're not a team player. And I'm referring not just, inside, not just outside the church, but even inside the church. The cost of discipleship is the same cost for our salvation. It's the cross. Why is there a cross? Well, because of the great controversy. You, so the great controversy shows that you, God cannot give everything good to people because Satan is saying, oh, he is following you because you are, be, you are blessing him. But don't worry. Blessings will come. But it's not everything. It's like the roses. There is always the thorns. The thorns there. Also, why is there a cost? Because of character development. Sufferings, sacrifices, develop your choices. When I was young, when I was uh, courting my, my wife, back, uh, my sweetheart back then, there were things that she would ask me to give up. And I thought, why? I love you and you love me. I don't need to do all of this. I don't need to give up things. But then I realized later on, when you choose her over the things that you are used to, then you are developing your love more and it becomes more real to you. I've given up so much for him. That's why many of the second generation Adventists do not value religion so much. They have not sacrificed for it. And they have to go through the suffering that you and I have gone through maybe in a different way before they can appreciate being a disciple of Christ. And then finally, why is there suffering? Because Jesus himself gave us the example. He did not come to, serve, to be served, but to serve. Now, what is the implication? Number one, don't water down the cost of discipleship. When you preach and teach in Asia, especially in poverty-stricken countries, 
I went to one country, I will not tell you which country it is. It's a poverty-stricken country, and it's so easy to get converts. You just tell those who are preparing, okay, I need this many people, and then they will come. The secret, you give noodles, sardines, every time they attend, and then they said, anyone who will bring five people tomorrow night will get this much money. And then we say, if you accept Jesus, he has promised to bless you. And then we quote the verse, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. But we forget, we, we lower that part wherein it says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. We emphasize, all these things shall be added to you. And many people want the, all these things. But they don't want the kingdom and the righteousness. So don't water down the cost of discipleship. Avoid a prosperity gospel. Avoid a prosperity gospel, especially in poor places. Because many, many converts nowadays are like the, the friends of, jo, uh, of Job. This is a Hebrew thinking, by the way, that God blesses those who please Him, and those who are getting sufferings, it's because they are not faithful to God. This is wrong theology. Sorry to the biblical, that's my apply application. I think that is wrong. Because look at Jesus. In fact, that's the reason why the Muslims don't want to believe that Jesus died at the cross. They said, Jesus is a prophet, and a prophet needs to be blessed by God. If he died on the cross, he's not a true prophet. But we believe he's a true prophet, then God will not allow him to suffer such a very uh, shameful experience. But Jesus showed us that he, the Son of God, he, our Master, went through the worst experience. He did not have, even have housing. I praise the Lord that I was, I'm being given housing here. He had no housing. He had no benefits. He was experiencing the worst. Now, the Bible says, Jesus says, the servant is not better than the master. And yet today, I think the servants are better than the master in terms of many of the comforts of life. Now, I'm not harping against these uh, benefits and things like that. The point is, let us not show people that to be a disciple, you will have all good things. Some of our converts, one of the converts in, among them, uh, a tribal group here in Mindoro, they said after being baptized and after a year, they backslided. And when they were interviewed, they said, because after one year of being Seventh-day Adventists, our life is not going better. We're not becoming richer. We're not like the missionary with all the cell phone and all these other things. And so, there's no difference between being a Seventh-day Adventist and being a, a tribal animist person. Okay? Look at Jesus. Principle number three, the source of true discipleship growth is God. Uh, uh, Paul says, I planted, Apollo watered, but God gave the, the growth. So, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. God is the source of real discipleship growth. By the way, I forgot talking about the other side. Sometimes when we talk about discipleship growth, we're talking in terms of numbers. Now, it's, it's true. When you have quality growth, there will be quantity growth. When you have a lot of growing Christians who are growing spiritually, they will... They cannot help it but share the truth to others. And then as people see them, their character, others are, 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 uh, they, they, they are attracted. But growth is not just about numbers. Jesus says, I will build the church. He will be responsible for the growth of each person. The pastors as well as the pastor. We are all disciples. And uh, we need to believe that. Now, I was telling you, sometimes we think growth should be in the number. Now, Jesus was what, maybe the greatest preacher, I'm not sure, but the greatest preacher that has ever preached. And he has thousands and thousands of people listening to him, right? 
At one point, there was 4,000, there was 5,000, only the men. And yet, after three and a half years, he only how, have how many disciples? 120 in the upper room, remember? 120. For me, that shows that he was not into the numbers. He was into the quality. Now, the good news is, when you have quality disciples, you can turn the world upside down. Amen? And that's what they did. From the 120, you instantly got 3,000 and so on and so forth. Okay? We cannot grow ourselves, but we can cooperate with God in the, in, and putting ourselves in a position to grow. Just like when, you have, when, there's, when it's raining, you are like a bottle. When you put the bottle up and you remove the, uh, the cover, the water comes in. But if you as a bottle are turned some other way, then you can only get so much. Especially if you're overturned, then you will never be filled. Growth comes from God, but we can cooperate through things that we do. Number four, the fruit of discipleship is fruit bearing. Well, fruit, no, the proof of discipleship is fruit bearing. John 15, 8 says, this is my, uh, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now some people say, what is that fruit? He said, the fruit is when you have so many converts. One university I was, uh, that I was teaching in another country, and uh, I heard that the pastors were taught by some of the professors, especially the ones in applied theology, they said, it's not just character that's needed, it's converts. Now I, I, I question that a bit. I mean, let's not emphasize so much in the converts, let's emphasize in our own character. Because Ellen White says the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is what? A loving and lovable Christian. The character. And so the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, this needs to be seen in a true disciple. Maybe not perfectly, but going on and on uh, as the years go by. Now, I like this tree. Uh, when when uh, Trevlin was asking me to look for the, the house that they, they, they would be assigning to us, I look at the surrounding, I see, are there trees? Do they have fruit trees? And some I see, there's avocado, some I see, there's bananas, some of them. And some places, there's, not, there's none. And so I like the ones that has fruit trees, but none like this. This is very nice if we have like that. Okay? Now, Matthew 12, 33 says, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. Pastors, as someone who's cooperating with God in discipling people, your goal should be the change of the heart, transformation, not information. If there's a problem in the church, it's because the heart has not been fully changed. What we need to do in discipleship is to make sure that they are drawing near to Jesus and that Jesus is able to change them. By their fruit you shall know them. True spirituality does not consist in what one does not do. It is rather what one does. Many times we like to do like this. We tell, how do you know you're a Seventh-day Adventist? I don't eat pork. I don't, I, I, I go to, uh, I, I don't work on the Sabbath. I, um, I don't keep my tithe. I, I, that means I give. <laughs> so, so, you know, Adventism is a lot of don'ts. Now, true discipleship is not about don'ts. It's about do. It's not about suppression. It's about expression. Now, you can only express good things if what is inside is good. And therefore, if our church members are not showing good things, it's because inside they only suppressed themselves on Sabbath. And so we are, some people say, you should not be seven day Adventist, you should be seven days Adventist. Now, we, we try to be good people for, from Sabbath school until divine worship. And then we can be ourselves again 
and then come back for AY, and then be good people again. Now, you, you've seen some of the monkeys in circus, right? The monkey is riding a bicycle, the monkey is wearing clothes, the monkey is playing basketball. Uh, no matter what you do with the monkey, he will still be a monkey. Let's not be monkeys in the Adventist church. We need to be converted. And that's why Jesus says, except ye be converted and become as a little child. That is very important. The good news is, if a man remains in Jesus, he will bear fruit. The good news is, as long as we continue drawing near to Jesus, you will have no difficulty in bearing fruit. If you're a banana tree, you will always bear fruit. Unless you're killed or you die. So, the implication is this. If we constantly commune and get into a meaningful relationship with Jesus, we will bear fruit. If our converts or Jesus' converts are communing with Jesus and getting to know Him day by day, they will bear fruit. And the first fruit is the character. And as their character is changed, the neighbors will look and they will say, I want to have what He has, what she has. I want to see. And number two, when many of us become more like Jesus in character, more people will come to church and say, we want to see Jesus. Do they see Jesus in you? Do they see Jesus in me? That is the question. When more of us become like Jesus in words and action, more people will say, I want to do join your church. I want to join your church. A loving and lovable Christian. Now, I wish we can offer an MA in, spiritual, in Christian spirituality. I wish we can offer a PhD in Christ-like character. By the way, you are in, in, in the school of Christ. They call it Christ University. Graduation day is when Jesus comes. Amen? What kind of PhD or MA do you want to have? For me, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And then the last principle, the reward of true discipleship is to become a friend of Jesus. Now, friendship with Jesus is the number one thing you can ever have in this world. I don't know about you, but just like Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. That's the greatest privilege. For a true disciple, the reward is not heaven, although it is there. For a true disciple, it's not even eternal life, although it is there. For a true disciple, the fact that we would be with Jesus forever, that is real reward. If Jesus is not the one you want to be with in heaven, if it's your wife or your husband or your children, that's not real discipleship. Yes, we want to have them there. But remember, Jesus says, if you love them more than me, you can just stay here on earth. Just like the story of Enoch, he walked with God in so close a relationship that going to heaven is just another step. You have known Jesus so much that being with him forever is just like another, another step. Revelation 14.4, it says here, It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruit of God, for God and the Lamb. Following Jesus wherever he goes. In conclusion, Enoch walked with God. What we have that I just described may be called a relational model of discipleship. The relationship is with Jesus. The focus of this model is Jesus, the person, not just the concept, not just the, the, the abstract. And the cost of this model of discipleship is a total commitment. There's cross to be, to be carried. And the growth comes from God. It's not an artificial growth. The fruit is a Christ-like character that attracts others to the foot of Jesus. And the reward is being with Jesus forever. My question, how many of you like that kind of discipleship model? Do you like that? Do you like that? How many of you would like to be on that discipleship way? Will you raise your hand? How many of you would like to say, Lord, 
not only will I be on that path, I will help others to be on that path of discipleship. Will you stand up as we pray? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to be your disciples. We want to be the real disciples of yours. And we want to help others to grow into mature disciples as well. We pray that you will help us in our walk with you. Help us to know how to come near to you every day. Help us to know how to follow and to walk in step with the Spirit. Help us to have that commitment 100% every day. And help us to, to share the way to others. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.